Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to Medicine for Nightmares for hosting this talk on this compilation of the Zapatista communiques on the Fourth World War. It's called La Cuarta Guerra Mundial, the Fourth World War in a bilingual edition. So it's very thick because it is bilingual. It's got the original, uh, an original Spanish on one side and carefully aligned the English to also help with language acquisition either way. And also so that you can help us put it together, fix the mistakes on the translation and not get mad. So thank you. Um, my name is Linda Kikirish, and I am one of the editors of this volume. And I am a popular educator, I'm a geographer, and I have accompanied the Palestinian struggle and the Zapatista struggle at around the same time for the last two decades. And the story of how that happened is contextual for, for what this book is about. The, the way that I encountered these two struggles what, it was at the same time while I was in university learning about globalization from below. I had done an undergraduate in business administration where in the 90s everyone was talking about globalization and what they meant by that. Like China's opening up, Mexico's opening up, and all of the factory jobs were being moved there because it was cheaper to do business, labor was cheaper, and environmental regulations are a lot, a lot lax, a lot more lax. And so it, I, I learned about globalization in the late 90s, especially with the internet becoming uh, more open and available, and with this question of now the so-called Cold War, the Soviet Union having fallen, and now capitalism was triumphant, or at least that was the whole narrative in the 90s. They called it the end of history. That was it, there's no more fights, capitalism has won, and now it's going to be the great, um, the great epitome of humanity is those who become capitalist subjects. And so it was also this moment where there was a lot of conversation, not, not that much, um, but enough to, to have me never forget that there was a conversation in business schools about how globalization was not sustainable, even though this is what everyone was pushing the globalization of capital, that globalization was not sustainable because there, in order for everyone to live like the so-called developed world, like the United States, we would need four Earths. Or in other words, capitalism is, is, is very taxing on the Earth in order to live in the kinds of comforts that in the developed nations we live in. And now today that statistic is five Earths. And the way that they talked about it in business schools and the way it's still talked about from those who are pro-capitalism, who don't see a problem with capitalism, is that there's a problem, but it's not capitalism. It's of too many people on the planet. And that's why like, you see a lot of, or you hear a lot of discussion about overpopulation uh, when you're listening to the pro-capitalist side talk about climate change. So usually like when you go to like a climate talk and you hear someone talking about overpopulations, they're, you already know they're not critical of capitalism at all. They are assuming that the ways that the, the world exists right now is good and more of it should continue to exist. And so you know this saying that goes, it's easier for many, for some, at least to imagine the end of the world before they can imagine the end of capital. Like that, that is a perfect example of that. And so what uh, the Zapatistas had, had, were saying at that time that I wasn't aware of because I didn't know about them in business schools. Nobody was talking about globalization from below or the struggles against capital. Uh, I would find that out across the campus in a master's program in geography when I took a class on globalization and I thought I already knew about globalization and I didn't, I only knew it from above, from the profit motive. And in, in business school, from above meant that whenever there was a question of how you're going to make money, it was always globalization, that's the answer. And for that, it was meant that we'll just move all the factory jobs to China or to Mexico or to somewhere. 
And, and, and that was a shift moment where, you know, today a lot of the things that, that we purchase are made in China. That, that was the mega start of that. China opened up in the late 70s and then really took off when the so-called Cold War ended. And so I say so-called Cold War because I would learn from the movements from below, and in particular the Zapatistas, that we've already actually done a third world war. We've been through those horrors already. And that's the Cold War, the so-called Cold War. The so-called Cold War was a war that was cold between NATO, the NATO countries, and the USSR, the nuclear powers. But it was hot everywhere else. If you, if you hear, if you study the, the wars under the Cold War, you see that humanity was on the brink of annihilation many times. And it was really, who knows, by the, the, the grace of the divine that we're still here. And there were regimes that were overthrown or, or, or uh, leaders assassinated in the other countries who, who did not fit into the configuration of either NATO or the USSR. The so-called Cold War, the Third World War, was a war that was cold for the above, for the global north, and it was hot for Africa, Asia, and uh, Central America, especially in the Caribbean. And so with the end of the Third World War, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the Zapatistas argue that that was the start of a new war that we are still in. And it is a very dangerous war because it is a war of annihilation, a war of extinction, of extermination, which is the climate catastrophe we're finding ourselves in right now. Because the Fourth World War is a war of capital against anything that gets in its way. Anything that gets in its way is the enemy of capital. And so here, I want to I wanna be clear with the way that I'm using that word, which is how I understand them to use that word. It's really nice that you have the original text so that you can decide for yourself. I don't want to say that I speak for the Zapatistas. I am a Zapatista in heart and in spirit, but I am not a member of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation or their bases of support. And that's really important to know because the Zapatistas speak for themselves. Nobody speaks for them. There are a lot of solidarity organizations. Zero of them are members of the Zapatistas. And that's really important because it kind of gets um, blurred sometimes. So I'm about to offer a definition of how I use that word capital that I believe is aligned with the way the Zapatistas use it, and please also read their own writings, and, and, and then you decide. And the reason why I say that is because there is a dominant version of, of the way that this word gets used, capitalism, in leftist discourse that I and many of us believe to be very limited. And so I will share with you the dominant one that we hear in academia and in activist left circles. And I'll also share with you the broader understanding of capital that I have and that I believe many of us have, including the Zapatistas. So the dominant use of this word capitalism often believes that there is a particular subject that is essential for capitalism to exist, and that is the worker. Largely the waged worker or the unwaged worker, like when we're talking about a household. Uh, with a, lot, a lot of feminist movements have talked about that women, even though they're traditionally not paid, they also contribute, they're exploited under capitalism and reproducing the worker so that the worker could go to work and you know, be fed and be well-rested and be loved and all of these social reproductive activities. The, they, they make a distinction between prior systems from Europe on the production of the world, whether it's slavery or feudalism or capitalism. This is kind of the trajectory that in the, in the history of Europe we're given. 
that slave society, there is a, a, a dialectical tension between the master and the enslaved. So the master is above and the enslaved is below. And the enslaved is the one that does the work, quote unquote, the labor. Under feudalism, that shifts to the lord and the serf where the serf does the work on the land that is the Lord's and pays tribute to the Lord or has to fight for the Lord. So there's still an exploitative above below relationship that's similar to master slave, except it is Lord and serf. It's not a, the type of slavery under, under that type of enslavement. So master slave and then lord and serf. So under slavery, the slave does the work. Under feudalism, the serf does the work. And then under capitalism, the worker does the work and the boss has, you know, is, it the, as, is in the position of the master or lord. So a lot of uses of this term capitalism stop there. They believe that the main contradiction under capitalism is the worker below and the boss above. That the worker does the work and the boss owns the land or the means of production and because of that fact, uh, feels like they have the right to take extra from whatever the worker does and that's how they make their profit. Okay, so that's the basic common understanding of capital within academia and within activist circles, largely Marxist circles. But it's not, there's a lot, all kinds of different Marxisms, so I don't want to say all Marxisms, but that's a very orthodox kind of way. And so then what follows is an understanding that the revolutionary subject is the waged worker. Where un under slavery, the revolutionary subject is enslaved. Under feudalism, the revolutionary subject is the serf. An expanded understanding of capital goes something like this. If we imagine, and this is just a basic transactional process under capitalism, that, that let's say Ton and I, we encounter each other, Ton makes paper and I make pencils. And if we were living in another system, we would just exchange and gift them to each other. But that's not capitalism. Capitalism requires an exchange per exchange in terms of time, and then that configures into money. So the way then that we would figure out this exchange of Tan's paper and my pencils is we would check with each other, okay, how long did it take you, like for one hour of your labor making paper, how much is that? 10 sheets, okay, that's five pencils for me. I make five pencils in one hour. So let's exchange your hour for my hour. Simple. There are some assumptions there that are really important for us to interrogate. There are at least three assumptions. One of those assumptions is that Ton and I are equals. One hour to one hour, we're equals, equality. Another is that we're property owners, property owners of the paper, property owners of the pencils. So property owners. So equality, property owners. And a third assumption is that we can keep contracts with each other. We, we'll conduct this exchange, and we're not going to blame the other one of theft. So contracts. Equality, property ownership, and contracts. And this is the foundation of liberal, the liberal rights system. The rights-bearing subject is the, is the subject that has the right to own property and to have equality before the law and to engage in contracts. That seems fine until we start to ask this question about what about the tree? It takes trees to make paper and pencils. But we're not asking under capitalism, we don't ask the tree. We don't consider the tree as having labored to make itself. We don't consider the tree as a, con a consensual being that we need to ask if we can cut you down to make some paper or pencils. And for sure, we're just not in a contract situation. There isn't this relation of equality with the non-human world in capital, but it's not just the non-human world. It's also those not considered human, like the enslaved peoples, like in this context, 
our African relatives who are considered just like property, just like with chattel slavery, just like any other animal. And with Native Americans who are close to nature, so anyone who's close to nature for capital is already in that level of that non-human, that non-rights-bearing human. And how would we even, though, account for a tree's labor? If we were to try to give the tree some rights, right? How would we even account for that under capitalism? Because what makes a tree a tree? We'd have to account for the soil microbes as well, not just the tree. We need to account for the wind that pollinates, or the, if it's an oak tree, the, the squirrel that hit the acorn forgot about it and from there grew a tree. We have to account for so much of the earth that is impossible accounting for capitalism because capitalism requires a profit. Capitalism requires a devaluation of the earth in order to extract that work, that energy, that power, and concentrate it as, as money or as, as power. Like right now, it looks like money in this context that we're in. So inherent to capitalism is a division of the earth where there's the humans who are superior and the non-humans who are inferior. So that is an expanded understanding of the depravity of capital and how capital, if it continues as it's going, leads, the logical conclusion is extinction. Is which? Extinction of life, of the earth. The earth is the enemy of capital in its devalorization. And the worker and the boss, that contradiction, that dialectic exists, but it exists within the realm of the human. The worker has rights like the boss has rights. They don't have the same amount of money for sure or power, but the human, capital H, that, that political human who has been decided over the last 500 years, even more, of who has rights, does not include most humans, and it does not include the majority of life on Earth. Okay, So that is how I am using this term, capital. And it's how I understand the Zapatistas to use it. And it's the way a lot of Native peoples understand it. There's been a lot of tension for many decades in struggle between Marxists and Native Americans because of this. So more recently, we saw it during the No Dapple protests uh, against the building of the pipeline, where Native Americans were taking the lead in that struggle against building the pipeline because pipelines leak and it's going to poison the water. And the AFL-CIO, the most organized union labor force in the United States, being pro-pipeline. Why? Because it creates jobs. And now this is something to not just condemn, it's something to understand. How did we get to a point where we need jobs? And so we're okay with the ravaging of the earth because we need jobs. We're, a lot of us, most of us, sadly, on the planet today, the vast majority, more than half, and this keeps growing, live in cities. Living in cities means that we do not have access to land and we need capitalism to survive. So we can be anti-capitalist all we want, but if we're not making moves to learn to live without capitalism, we're gonna have a major conflict of interest and we're not gonna go anywhere. We need to learn to live without capitalism. So with that, the Fourth World War. What is the Fourth World War? So in this book, there are so many writings that the Zapatistas have, thousands of communiques, maybe it's already hundreds of thousands. Of thousands. They've been sharing their word since uh, the uprising in 19, the eve of 1990, January 1st, 1994, until recently. 
And January 1st, they had a, their most recent communique was this past January 1st, which was the 30th year anniversary of their uprising. So we couldn't include all of the communiques, uh, but we included uh, the following, and I'll just list them out. The first one was published in 1997. It's called Seven Loose Pieces of the Global Jigsaw Puzzle, and that's where they introduced to the world their theorization on the Fourth World War. And it, and it, and it gets a little bit more in depth a couple of years later in 1999, the next one, which is what are the fundamental characteristics of World War IV? And the fundamental characteristics that they outline have to do with, the, a lot of it has to do with the role of the nation state. How has the nation state's role changed under globalization, quote unquote, under the Fourth World War? And they talk about how after every world war, there's a new configuration of the world map. It's changed, you know, and they're starting with the first world war as we know it, the second world war as we know it. They also call themselves a product of 500 years of struggle, so they know that the, the world wars did not begin with the first world war, but with 1492 forward, at least on this side of the globe as we've experienced it. But they, can, they, they go on with the uh, first world war, second world war, third world war, and they talk about the differences between the third world war and then the fourth. And one major difference was that under the Third World War, there was a focus on national economies. It was like wars between states, nation states. A state is an instrument of force that has the monopoly of violence within a given territory. A nation state maintains that instrument of force, that monopoly of violence within a, a given territory. And it assumes that there is a nation that is the authority over that violence. So like democracy, for example, as we know it. And the nation is an idea that is often traced to the French Revolution in 1789, even though the US Revolution happened before then. The French Revolution was really central in the history of the modern world because it overthrew the monarchy and then how to figure out how, how are we gonna govern ourselves. This is the French. And a lot of these ideas of the Enlightenment came from the Americas, came from their interactions with Native peoples and with African peoples who would challenge them on, like, that's your boss, like, you listen to that guy, like, you're not part of a democratic decision-making process or part of a community. And so a lot of these ideas that became Enlightenment ideals in Europe came from these interactions here, and so there was a lot of revolutionary spirit within Europe. And the French Revolution was part of that, where they overthrew the monarchy and then had this problem of, okay, so who's gonna govern? And they said, well, the people. Okay, so who are the people? And so now the stakes are really high. Who are the people? And so you get this idea of the nation that congeals, the national identity, this idea, well, the people are the ones who share the same language, share the same history, the same culture and will agree most of the, you know, mostly on how they will be governed. And what that does is it homogenizes space. It homogenizes that territory that's going to be the nation state where now everyone has to speak that same language even though that wasn't the reality and even within Europe, so many languages have been destroyed for this idea of the nation. And this is where we have the modern problem of anti-Semitism. This is where Jews in Europe would have already been persecuted many times before, in 1492 very famously with the Inquisition. And then in the 19th century with nationalism, Jews in Europe found themselves not fitting in. And so like, there was a lot of debates over how do we survive this? And some believe, well, we need to assimilate. We need to stop looking like we're different. We need to stop being different. And I think that a lot of us know that growing up here. It's not just a Jewish question. It's an all of us question, assimilated to whiteness, assimilated to Americana, for example. 
another, another strain of resistance thought, well, we need to have a global uprising with workers. So this is like the anti-capitalist, the Bunds, for example, are probably the most famous. There were others who were like, no, we're going to be even more our own selves, so we become more like orthodox. And then there's Zionism. And Zionism was the proposal that didn't speak to the people, but spoke to the empires, asking the empires for a place for safety for Jews. That in the founding fathers of Zionism, particularly Theodor Herzl, argued that the reason for anti-Semitism was a Jewish problem. So <laughs> rather than a racial problem, a systemic problem, he believed it to be a Jewish problem, kind of like how the black and brown misleadership class believes that we're the problem and that we need to assimilate. That's, that's how theater hurts, all, that very reactionary, from above, elitist kind of uh, movement. He believed that the problem of anti-Semitism is that Jews were all over the world scattered as a minority in these new nation states, and therefore they didn't belong to the nation part. And so what they needed to do was to get together and create a nation state. And he didn't care if it was going to be in Palestine. He actually was hoping you know, they're anywhere. Argentina, Uganda, part of like the colonial cutting up of Africa was part of that scheme. And it ended up, as we know, being in Palestine. So this is very important for us to understand when, we, when we're thinking about Palestine, this question of nationalism, this question of how do we organize ourselves politically? Because the nation state is the default position that we grow up with, that we are told that that's how we have to organize and that's how a lot of Palestinians have been organizing, although there's a lot of, a lot of different proposals. Palestinians are unified on the right to resist. And then in terms of what next, they differ. But they have the right to resist. And I, I am someone who absolutely 100% supports the resistance of the below. I condemn the context that may has to make anybody have to resist for their existence. I condemn the context of an above and a below. To condemn the resistance of the below is like condemning physics. Like the below is going to resist. Let's make it so that we don't have a context where people have to resist. So the, the characteristics of the Fourth World War are that the nation state, as we've known it, as we've grown up learning about it, articulating with it, no longer exists in that way. There is a decomposition of society, of the nation worldwide for globalization. It is global capitalism that is the sovereign now, and nation states are the administrators. The politicians are the administrators of capital. So this is like when we hear about neoliberalism, for example, which is a, the word that we were hearing a lot in the 90s and the early 2000s. Neoliberalism being this, this, this ideology, precisely that, that states need to, instead of providing social services like schooling, like, um, or like education, or like healthcare or housing, the energies, the resources of the state have to be to create a good business climate. And that means making sure that there is private, pro the, pri the logic of private property on lands where that did not exist, and they did not exist, that did not exist here, did not exist in most of the world. And infrastructure to move commerce, because there's a lot of extractivism now taking place. Territories that had been ignored before as, known, as backwaters all of a sudden become valuable because of those natural resources. And so that infrastructure has to be in place. Private property has to be in place and the state basically becomes a police force for capital. And this is what we've been seeing since the 90s. We saw a lot of protests in the 90s and in the 2000s against these schemes like NAFTA, the, National, or the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and, and many, like the Eurozone, for example, that was obliterating nations 
the nation. So, so you still have the state, you still have the instrument of force, but the people don't get to decide what the state does. Instead, it's capital that's deciding. Okay, so that is a, an enormous characteristic of the Fourth World War is the shift of the role that the state plays. The state is still around, but the state is not sovereign. And this is actually something that the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, Huey Newton, was talking about in the early 70s. He had come across a magazine, I think it was a Business Week, where, and it was the height of the so-called Cold War, the Third World War, and he saw an interview with one of the CEOs of an American car company. And they were asking the CEO, how do you plan to expand your markets into those countries that don't like the United States? You're an American car, American car company. And his answer was, well, what flag do they like? We can wave whatever flag that they want. And that's where Huey Newton's like, the nation, the nation state of sovereign does not exist, even back then in the 70s. And this was really important for their struggle as Panthers, because at first he said, we used to be black nationalists, and then we saw what was going on in the world, and we became black internationalists. But then we saw we can never be sovereign. We can never be autonomous anywhere in the globe, because the US is now a global empire. It's a military machine, you know? Money, the money, the capital machine. And that's when he said, we are intercommunalists now. Rather than internationalists, there's no nation to fight for. Intercommunalists, so then that, his geography became this network geography rather than a containerized geography. And that is very much a Zapatista geography as well. There's been a lot of these connections between the Panthers um, and the Zapatistas that have been made, understanding that their histories are different and so similar in terms of what, you know, what the below below. In the United States, black people are the below below. Like in a white supremacist context, Mexico is also a white supremacist context, their main contradiction is the native. They're for sure black people in Mexico, just like in many other places in, in the Americas, but the, the population isn't big enough to be their main contradiction for sure, it remains anti-black though. In Mexico, a lot of it is Europe versus non-Europe. That was like the, the main colonial contradiction. In the US, that's the same, and then it ref gets refined with the white and non-white. So there's been a lot of these connections made. Um, I think it, it'd be really interested to interesting to continue making them, though, about how movements, movements are thinkers, movements are theoreticians and philosophers. They're trying to figure something out concretely which is very different from what maybe many of us who've been in a university seminar where you're just kind of like a lot of hypotheticals and then like not really trying to answer a question. They're trying to answer some questions because they need to be right, because they're in war, they're fighting, they're fighting back. So those first two essays, seven loose pieces of the global jigsaw puzzle, and what are the fundamental characteristics of World War IV? Talk about this shift in uh, capital, the shift of the nation state, and how it just creates even more inequality, even more inequality, and more hierarchy. The next one that we decided to include uh, is in, from 2011. It's called Notes on Wars, and it's an exchange of letters between Subcomandante Marcos, who used to be the spokesperson of the Zapatistas, and Luis Villoro, who was the late Luis Villoro. Uh, he was a very prominent philosopher in Latin America who was trying to get at the contradictions of the left, the contradictions of justice movements. But for him, the way that he defined the left was an ethical posture, not in some specific category an ethical posture against injustice. That's it, an ethical posture against injustice. And then kept seeing that a lot of movements that were trying to get at, you know, trying to fight injustice, kept reproducing domination and oppression and exploitation. And those are contradictions, contradictions. And he never let anyone get away with the contradictions. And one of his great contributions was to start with context first, 
and then see how the identities are shuffling. So don't start with identity first. Because there is no identity that is eternally oppressor and eternally oppressed. It depends on context. And we saw this earlier in an earlier communique from Marcos in 1994, when um, the naysayers, again, the anti-Zapatistas, very machista society in Mexico, were trying to accuse him of being gay, as if that was going to be an insult. So then he like, writes back, he's like, yeah, Marcos is gay. Marcos is gay in San Francisco, black in South Africa, Chicano in San Isidro, Jewish in Germany, Palestinian in Israel. See the context shift? It's not just identity, it's the context. Don't start with identity first because then we're going to fall in this trap that there's an identity that is always oppressed or always oppressor. So that was Luis Villoro was a philosopher talking about similar things, and then the Zapatistas rise up, and he's like, whoa, like we're, 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 we're saying something similar. He ended up, un unbeknownst to everybody until he died, he ended up joining and being, ex he, he ended up begging to be a Zapatista, and they're like, no, they, like Zapatistas don't like to just allow, allow anyone. They're like, you go struggle where you are, that's where you're stronger, right? And in the, there's a book called, um, critical thought in the face of the capitalist hydra that has an homenaje, an homage, to Luis, Luis Villoro when he died. And it revealed that he had been a Zapatista and like the whole process that they went to and went through in that. It's a really beautiful, a really beautiful communique. Um, so in this one, Notes on Wars, it's an exchange of letters between Sub Marcos and Luis Villoro, where they bring in this question of ethics how can we, you, we, we find a war and maintain an ethical position? So I'd like to read a bit of that. It's a lot longer than what I'll read, but I want to read. And I want to begin with that because this is a really tough topic. We're talking about annihilation, extinction, you know. Yes? Can you just have Oh, absolutely. Anyone has the book. Absolutely. And we turn to page 313. It's called uh, Part 4, Ethics and Our Other War. I'm just going to cough real quick. <coughs> okay. And so I'll just read, I think it's just, um, yeah, it's just the two pages. We have said before that war is inherent to capitalism and that the struggle for peace is anti-capitalist. You, Don Luis, have also said, quote, social morality constitutes only a first pre-critical level of ethics. So social morality. Critical ethics begins when the subject separates itself from the forms of morality that are in force and actually questions the validity of its rules and actions. From this angle, it can be seen that social morality doesn't live up to the virtues it claims for itself, end quote. So here's Marcos. Is it possible to bring ethics to war? Is it possible to make it break through military parades, military ranks, checkpoints, operations, combats, deaths? Is it possible to bring it to question the validity of military rules and behavior? Or is the mere thought of this possibility just an exercise in philosophical speculation? Because perhaps the inclusion of that quote unquote other element in the war would only be possible in a paradox. Including ethics as a determining factor in the conflict would bring about a radical recognition. The opponent knows that the result of his quote unquote triumph will be its defeat. And I'm not referring to defeat as quote unquote destruction or quote unquote abandonment, but rather to the negation of its existence as a fighting force. That is a force makes war and if it wins, it will mean its disappearance as a force. If it loses, the consequences will be the same. But no one makes war with the idea of losing it. Well, Felipe Calderón does. He was the president who started the war with the cartels. And this is the paradox of Zapatista war. If we lose, we win. And if we win, we win. The key here is that ours is not a war that intends to destroy our opponent in the classical sense. 
It is a war that attempts to eliminate the grounds for its realization, as well as a possibility for the existence of the opponents, us included. It is a war so that we may cease to be who we are, so that we can be who we should be. This has been possible because we recognize the other, the others who in different lands of Mexico and the world, without being the same as us, suffer the same pain we do, carry on a similar resistance, that struggle for a multiple identity that won't annihilate, dominate, or conquer, and who desire a world without armies. So this is the importance of this framework for those of us who don't want war, who know we need to fight a war, but we don't want to keep fighting one. We're trying to fight one so that there won't be armies anymore. That's the horizon. And so the framework that I think is really helpful that they offer us is a distinction between a way of relating to each other where difference is ranked as superior and inferior. And we, we get this a lot in everyday life. Even as little kids in schools, we were ranked A, B, C, D, F, or worse, right? There's always a ranking. There's a ranking for how we look, what kind of house we live in, what kind of shoes we wear. There's, there's a ranking, ranking, ranking. There isn't just difference. Oh, we're just different. There's above and below, and its fuel is that the below seeks to go above. Its fuel is that rather than fleeing that situation and creating something else, which is with the Maroons, the enslaved Africans who ran away and created other societies with Native Americans and misfit Europeans, if there isn't that instinct to flee, then we are stuck in trying to survive, and the only way to survive is to go above. And to go above means that a below must remain. They talk a lot about how, I mean, this is a structure and they use a building as a metaphor. A building that is set up so that the floors above are crushing the floors below, the basement below. And so we need to go build another building. We need to go build another structure that doesn't do that. And it's not necessarily one that won't have different floors. It's not about like the literal above and below. It's about the way that power is circulating. The way that power circulates with an above-below configuration, the above oppresses the below and extracts from the below and in and, and its most naked violence or annihilates the below to get out of the way, right? It has some kind of force on the below. The below, in our participation to become above, continue giving it its legitimacy and its fuel. So then what do we need to do? The Zapatista women are the ones who taught me about this when they say that they, in their struggle, they're not trying to eliminate men, they're not trying to be superior to men, they're not trying to keep those relation, that relation of domination just with the chairs switched. They're trying to be juntos y a la par, together and side by side, with difference. The above and the below annihilates difference or absorbs difference, not like they said. Annihilate, dominate, or conquer difference. The side by side is strong because of difference. The Zapatista women say, we are equal because we are different. So they begin with the premise of equality, whereas the above and below begins with the premise of inequality. There's a standard to be a rights-bearing subject, for example, you have to have citizenship. This is something Palestinians don't have, they don't have a state. So they're not understood as rights-bearing subjects. And not just Palestinians. But this is the problem of deciding that there is an equality that we need to reach. It creates inequality just by setting a standard. With a side-by-side, -side, we are equal because we are different. It understands that our differences, the biodiversity of Earth, is our power. We are powerful because of our differences, not in spite of our differences. And it's also a collective that is very different 
from like Soviet Union type of communism, where Soviet Union type of communism wanted to make everybody the same. It was redistributive in that way, trying to have everybody live the same. And the state would take care of everybody in that way. And it didn't really allow for, in, for an individuality, a uniqueness to a person, which then made it so that capitalism was really attractive to a lot of people. Because when you find the collective oppressive and over here the capitalist world is saying, you could be free to be who you want, then it overcorrects and it only focuses, mostly it focuses on the individual. So now you're an individual without a community, without a collective as if that's the way that the world works. It's not the way the way, it's not the way the world works. We need each other, we're all intertwined. But how do we have a commons or a collective that makes it so that we're a collective and everybody's difference is nurtured. Everyone in their different powers, their different energy, their different fates, you know? That's the beauty of we are equal because we are different. It's a very, very different way of understanding relationality, and it's a very ancient way. It's a very Maya, I mean, the Zapatistas are Maya, I want to say, because some people don't know that the Maya are still alive, because they talk about the Maya as a collapsed society, because the temples and the cities collapsed, and then they think that is like this tragedy without even bothering to think that maybe it was the people that brought that down. It was very destructive on the earth, those cities. And so then we have a lot of decentralization in the Maya world since then, with many different languages, many different languages, and actually throughout the Americas, of Yala, Turtle Island, there, there were, there still are, but many languages have been exterminated. There, was, there were and still are many languages, and if we follow the corn, the maize, which it's, its birthplace was in Mesoamerica, Mexico area, south of Mexico, the southern Mexico part. But it spread throughout the entire continent. Maize, if you've ever planted maize, you know that you need human hands in order to open up the, the mazorca. Um, English, what's the, <laughs> the husk. Yeah, you need it to, in order to, for the seeds to then plant. Like, so it's like a symbiosis. That's why the Maya say we are people of the maize. We see that there's been migration, there's been interaction exchange, and still the preservation of many, many different worlds, many different languages. So we can interact with each other without having to annihilate each other and force one language on each other, which is sadly what the Europeans have done to these lands. And what has happened with uh, globalization is continued extermination of languages. As the Zapatistas say, not for English, but for computer science. It's another language. Technology they were talking about this in the 90s. So we have then notes on wars in that if we bring in an ethical position, an ethical position in fighting this war, this struggle for life, which the Zapatistas call it for life. Not even just for humanity, it's not even certain anymore about humanity, but for life. Then we need to figure out how we're going to fight it while creating, nurturing, strengthening these other worlds where we're side by side and different together with the diversity of life. So it takes a strategic and tactical understanding of how those of us especially who live in, in the heart of this beast, who have a, a lot of feet, uh, both feet in there, we're trying to at least get one foot out, what is our ethical relationship to this world and this world, right? So it, that's the kind of level of struggle that, they're, that they encourage us to think at, that level, the metaphysical level, the cosmological, the whole thing, the ethics question. And it's something sadly that has, is not really commented on, uh, on, on in leftist movements. It's usually left up to, like religions think about ethics all the time, or spirituality a lot of the time. The new agey stuff is mostly about the individual, not, not about the, the bigger collective, right? If, 
but whatever it is that we call it, our spirituality, our individual, our, our ideology, our um, yeah, our religion, or our movements, you know, feminism, art, like whatever formation we're in, we need to talk about ethics. Ethics, this question of how do we relate to the other? How do we relate to ourselves? How are we understanding the cosmos as intertwined, as already predestined? You know, these are huge questions for all of us, all of our movements to have. So the Zapatistas encourage us to go to the, those heights, to the whole thing. And then we can figure out together in our, from our different corners of struggle, what's going on in your corner of the world? How about yours? How about yours? How about yours? You know, it's all gonna look different, but what, is, what are those common threads that we're, that we're finding? So we can struggle together. So, Notes on wars, we included it because of this really important ethical question. Tomorrow, at the same time here, the author of Islam and Anarchism will be here, which is a, and he wrote a book that's available as well, and that's, to me, I've been waiting for it for 10 years since I met him. I met him on like, Twitter. He, he asked me about the Zapatistas, and then he ended up going and um, met the Muslim Zapatistas and has this whole um, contribution about this ethical, political question, which to me is so important as someone who thinks about how are we going to build a world where many worlds fit, which is the famous Zapatista call. Religions are worlds. Movements are worlds. You know, whether they're secular or, or not, we have different worlds. How are we going to share the world together with all our different so that we're not trying to make everybody the same? Which is a really important question, especially right now in this context of climate collapse, where we're hearing even more and more and more this phrase, overpopulation. I was at a climate talk um, in my community in Chumash territories in the community college, brought some um, community people to talk about the climate. This was like 2018. And a woman put up um, on her PowerPoint this website that she really likes and that everyone should go there to this website to learn about solutions. And so I go to the website and then I already, immediately I see something about overpopulation. And I click on it and there's a photograph of a baby from Gaza the two millionth person born, or two millionth person, the baby Walid, which is born in Gaza, has nothing to do with climate change, but that is what these folks are thinking about when they're talking about overpopulation. They're talking about people who are not like them. They're, this is the eco-fascist position. All of our movements are at risk for co-optation. All of our religions, all of our spirit, everything is at risk. Is it going to be for empire? Is it going to be for the earth? Is like the, the big tensions that I see, right? And is an ecological movement going to be for empire or going to actually be for the earth? This is a really big question we need to ask. The eco-fascist movement believes that the planet is in severe danger and we need to save the planet. And there are too many people on the planet is what they say. And so their solution is to kill everybody who's not like them to maintain the planet. And so they use this discourse. Our own, our own stuff gets turned against us all the time. So we need to, to be careful about what proposals are we talking about? Are we talking about proposals that replicate that above and the below? Or are we truly with the earth? Side by side by side by side by side by side with all our difference, all of our biodiversity. After notes on wars, there are five more, four more communiques. And the next one is from 2021. It's called A Declaration dot, 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 for Life, which was kind of like a play on their declarations. The Zapatistas, their declarations, they're on the sixth declaration. The first declaration was a declaration of war against Oblivion in, on January 1st, 1994. And then they had other declarations, and each one was like a shift in strategy is how I see it. I'm not sure if that's what it is, but that's how I see it where the first one was the, the gun, 
Then the next one was more listening and then you know, dialogue and then trying to build a political front. Really trying with the political parties until the sixth declaration from two, that was uh, issued in 2005 to, through 2006. That one talked about how we've tried with the above, we're not trying with them anymore. We're trying with the below. We've gotten to know enough people all over the world who see us for who we are. They're not wagging their finger down at us. They're not trying to be our servants. You know, they're also struggling. So we want to connect with other movements from below and not try to take the state. I mean, their, their whole analysis of why would you take the state? The state is subservient to capital, and it's really difficult to get out of that, if not impossible. This is a war that makes this be the truth, makes this be a fact. And that ended up making a lot of people abandon the Zapatistas, a lot of people on the left, because they did not support the presidential candidate, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, this was in 2006. And so it ended up being, you know, when he lost, he lost through a stolen election, but then the left from above, and this is a really helpful move the Zapatistas made, they showed us the left is split. They showed what already exists. There's a left from above and a left from below. An authoritarian left, vanguard elite that thinks that it has all the answers and the people are not smart enough to govern themselves, so there has to be an intelligentsia or some kind of political class, technocrats, you know, who will have all the answers. That's the left from above. They're mostly focused on taking the state. They're not necessarily anti-capitalist, especially with the Fourth World War. That's something, it's a characteristic of the Fourth World War is that, I don't know if there's even any more exceptions, although Cuba's trying to hold on, but there are, with almost with zero exceptions, all of the states have accepted capitalism. They're really, and when you listen to Russia and China, the so-called BRICS, who are being called the Global South, although I don't know when Russia became part of the Global South, and now China's trying to say it's part of the Global South, but it's using a similar developmentalist discourse that the United States had been using after the Second World War, that we're gonna help these underdeveloped countries develop, but of course develop a capitalist, even though <laughs> the same logic of capital, even if they call it something else, communism. Whatever it is that they call it, Check to see how power is circulating. Check to see, are they with the earth? Or are they with empire? Are they left from above? Or are they left from below, right? So the Zapatistas conceptually helped us in showing us the left is split. They didn't split the left. They showed us it was already split from above and below. So the Sixth Declaration talks about the left from below. And so it caused a lot of the left from above to completely trash them, abandon them, talk all kinds of mess, say they no longer existed, they're no longer relevant. And since, and, they're, and also, what, what a lot of leftists had, had um, looked to the Zapatistas to was for the gun. But when the Zapatistas decided they weren't gonna continue fighting, I mean, they never put down their weapons, they still maintain the right to self-defense. But they focus their energies on building their autonomy, not asking for autonomy, building it. Their own clinics, their own schools, their own justice systems, their own economies, their own co-ops. That's what exiting that, this system of above and below and building autonomy. It's a very material basis. And this is something to really understand about the Zapatistas. There's a lot of, uh, in the United States, and it's not just the United States, there's a lot of, in the cities, an understanding of the Zapatistas as like making art. There's like an aesthetic, but there isn't really an engagement with their theory. They're not really understood as theoreticians, although you just heard, and you'll hear some more. Um, and there's also this difficulty, again, of thinking through how are we going to live without capitalism? And that's a question that I didn't have until I went to the little school, the Zapatista Little School, the Escuelita. In 2013 and 14, they had three sessions where they invited thousands of people from all over the world, whoever wanted to come, to come and live with the Zapatista family for a few days. And we all went to our different 
families, and it was random, it was beautiful, and it was magic. And I, I can't believe that it worked, and we all came back in one piece. Um, but as I was there, you know, it, they had us, um, they had built my own shower, my own toilet, so that, you know, the foreigners could be comfortable. They fed us. They gave me shelter. I remember thinking, when I first got there, I thought I saw a scorpion, and they're like, oh, no, but it's okay. We have two curanderos in the village, two healers in the village, you know? And I was like, wow, they're, they're, I'm eating because of them. I have shelter because of them. I have all of this because of them. And then I'm like mapping in my mind how I get everything at home and I have to pay for everything. I have to buy everything. I need capitalism to survive is what I realized. And I was like, I can be anti-capitalist all I want in words, but I need to do it in deeds. And in the city, you know, this is, this is then like where I think a lot of us who do like urban gardening or try like to do restorative justice and the, the little bit of alternative schools, the little bit that we can do. And it's, and it's really important and it's still very limited without the question of land. We are land-based animals. We need land in order to live. Land is being used for us to live. Land is being destroyed for us to live. Land is being poisoned for us to live, right? And we don't see it. We don't often see it unless like, we go visit communities and struggle against mining, against this kind of waste. And then it becomes real. But the ways that our lives are designed in cities, especially in big cities like San Francisco, LA, New York, Chicago, the mega cities, it's really, they are so delicate, delicate in the way that they run. And it's really important also to, in climate crisis that we're in, to, uh, to recognize that, the, that cities are, are, are really fragile when it comes to any kind of energy crisis, for example. There's a book that the Zapatistas recommended we all read. I don't know if it's been translated into English yet. But in 2015, uh, they were talking about it. Uh, it's called Colapso, Collapse, by Paco Ignacio Taibo. And it talks about, like there's a little zine in English like in, on the internet that you can find, the summary. And it talks about how with climate collapse and an energy crisis, cities cannot withstand those kinds of, those kinds of shifts in energy production. And he predicts that cities will collapse. It's not just the earth, he's talking cities. And imagine like, just, just thinking of that, even just for half a day, what that's gonna look like. Remember the toilet paper with COVID? Right, like that, that I think did freak out a lot of people. A lot of people started moving away from the city. Like the Hudson Valley, a lot of people from Manhattan now live in the Hudson Valley in Northern New York and people are buying land. So these are really important questions for all of us to think about how are we going to make it through this storm? How are we going to fight for more for generations beyond ours? How are we going to fight for something that we likely will not see come to fruition in our lifetime? And they talk about that in recent communiques about 120 years. Seven generations, very Native American cosmology. How do we, how do we organize today so that a little girl, 120 years from now, who none of us is going to meet, doesn't have to fight the same fight, has other fights, easier fights, you know, but not the same one. We don't want the world to be the same as it is right now. The Declaration for Life in 2021. And I think, I won't read that just for time. I want to read one more thing. But the, a declaration for life, it says a declaration dot, dot, dot. It was kind of like a play, like, oh, is this the seventh declaration? You know, but it was not. It was a declaration for life. And I really recommend you read it. It's very short. And it talks about all of the things that bring us together and all of the reasons why we're different. And the list of what, what makes us different is a lot longer than what brings us together. But then what are our commitments and our understandings is what bring us together. So that's a really beautiful one to read. And it also talks about how they are planning on visiting all five continents to get to know other struggles. And the first one, they've already visited Europe. 
And I, I went while they were there, and that was something that was really difficult for me because it was Spain, and I never wanted to go to Spain and, and France. Uh, but I got to meet people from below, like Spain from below, France from below, like, oh yeah, there's a Europe from below. Of course there's a Europe from below, you know? And, and it, it really helped me with my geography, particularly the tension that I have with Europe in terms of colonialism, you know? And uh, it was really beautiful. And so they, they have talked about how they want to visit all the other continents too, however, whenever that's going to happen. They haven't said yet. The next one is 2023 of sowings and reapings. And that is a communique that came out in October, after October 7, in support of the Palestinians. And it was a reprint from a communique from 2009 with Operation Cast Lead, the first time Israel carpet bombed Gaza. Um, and it sounds almost exactly the same, you know, and they reprinted it. And that's in, uh, in this book. And then an another one that we included was the other rule of the excluded third, which I'll read from. And then the last one that we included is the common and non property. So I'll just read the. Um, Excerpt from The Other Rule of the Excluded Third. Let me see what page. Page 379, Failure as a Goal. I'll read this because this is a very recent communique, 2023. It talks about the method, the method of the Zapatistas, and in particular, Marcos, who is no longer the subcomandante insurgente. Uh, the spokesperson or the leader of the military. So the Zapatistas have a military, the EZLN, and they have the bases of support. And Marcos was a spokesperson of the military, but a sub-commander. Sub meaning that he was subject to whatever the, the council, the CCRI decided, which is made out of people and fighters, whether they go to war or not. Okay, so that's where the sub part so when they, when they went to war back with the Mexican government on January 1st, 1994, they ended up with the sixth declaration in 2005, 2006. So those, that 10 years over a decade, we see that in that declaration, in the sixth declaration, they say, we had a contradiction that we needed to figure out. And the contradiction is that we have a military and the military is hierarchical but we're not trying to build a hierarchical world, but we still need a military. And so what they did is they, made, they have made their military subservient to the people. So this is really important to, to understand because if we focus too much on form rather than the circulation of power, then we're gonna get stuck in a place that is highly co-optable because horizontality can be very co-optable by the corporate world. In fact, a lot of corporations run like that now. But their power is still circulating under capitalist circuits. So the military then is subservient. Marcos was such a prominent figure in, in Zapatismo. As a spokesperson, he spoke many different languages and was very, writes very, very beautifully. And in fact, um, there's a book called The Fire and the Word that talks about the history of the Zapatistas in clandestinity, those 10 years before they rose up. And the fire in the word talks, the fire in the word, that title gestures to the fire of the gun and the word that communicates, in this case. The communiques were so powerful, it's important to know and never forget that the Zapatistas were the first movement of the internet in 1994. Not that they had the internet, but the journalists that were getting their communiques were putting them all out on the internet and their supporters. And so it was pelting the Mexican government who was against them. Each time they didn't know when a new communique was gonna come out and then there's a new Marcos communique and it's like tongue lashing, you know? It's, it's a, it was an enormous weapon and it still is. Um, but Marcos became such a prominent figure that people thought that Marcos was the Zapatistas, and that was a big contradiction. So they had to kill him off in the you know, symbolic sense. 
And there's a really beautiful communique if you want to check it out. His last communique is called Between Light and Shadow. And if you do Between Light and Shadow, EZLN, likely you will get their Enlace Zapatista page, which is where they have all of the communiques. And also on the, yeah, in the, in the Verso page of this book, it, it uh, gives you the link of all of where you can find all the original Zapatista communiques. So it's really important to know Marcos has, is, is no longer here, he's defunct. He became, for many years, Galeano, Subcomandante Insurgente Galeano, named as such because there had been a teacher, Zapatista teacher, who had been killed by the, by the paramilitaries in 2014, who knew, nobody knew. They only knew Marcos, and so Marcos killed himself on stage and then became Galeano, so now everybody has to say Galeano. And that was um, his role for many years was no longer dealing with the mainstream media, but instead dealing with the alternative, free, whatever it's called, media. So he would. So people weren't allowed that that day when that happened. The mainstream media was not allowed in at all. And since then, in um, in the fall of 2023, we learned that. Sub Galeano has ceased to exist, and now it is Captain Marcos, Capitan Marcos. So all that, just so that we could read this part of the communique, what is the role of Captain Marcos? Page 379, failure as a goal. To understand what that brief dialogue meant, a dialogue before this section, I must explain a part of my job as captain. In this case, a work that I inherited from the late Sub Galliano, who in turn received it from the late Sub Marcos. A thankless, dark, and painful task, foreseeing the Zapatista failure. If you are considering an initiative, I look for everything that could make it fail, or at least reduce its impact. Look for the contradictory opposite, Let's say something like Marcos Contreras. I am, therefore, the maximum and only representative of the pessimistic wing of Zapatismo. And this is a, the Contreras figure was like the, kind of like the investigator in, in Mexico City, you know, and so it's like Marcos Contreras, he's a, t a different kind of investigator, researcher. The objective is to attack the initiatives with all types of objections from the moment they begin to be born. We suppose that this causes this proposal to be refined and consolidated, whether it be an internal organizational or an external initiative, be it a combination of these two. To put it clearly, Zapatismo prepares itself to fail. That is, it imagines the worst case scenario. With that horizon in perspective, plans are drawn up and proposals detailed. To conceive these quote unquote future failures, the sciences that we have at our disposal are used. You have to look everywhere, and when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere, including social networks and their bot farms, fake news, and the tricks that are carried out to get followers, quote unquote. Obtain the greatest amount of data and information, cross it, and thus obtain the diagnosis of what the perfect storm would be and its result. You must try to understand that it is not about building a certainty but rather a terrible hypothesis. In terms of the deceased, suppose everything goes to shit. Contrary to what one, might believe, one may believe, this catastrophe does not include our disappearance, but something worse, the extinction of the human species. Well, at least as we conceive it today. This catastrophe is imagined, and we begin to look for data that confirms it, real data, not the prophecies of Nostradamus or the biblical apocalypse or equivalent. That is scientific data, scientific publications, financial data, trends, records of facts, and many publications are then used. From this hypothetical failure, the clock is set in reverse. The rule of the excluded third. Already in possession of the drawing of the collapse and its inevitability, the rule of the excluded third begins to work. No, it is not the known one. This is an invention of the late Sub Marcos. 
In his time as lieutenant, he said that in the event of a failure, the solution was first attempted, second a correction, and third, since there was no third, it remained as there is no remedy. Later, he refined that rule until he reached the one that I now explain to you. If a hypothesis is supported by true data and scientific analysis, it is necessary to look for two elements that contradict the aforementioned hypothesis in its essence. If these two elements are found, the third is no longer sought, then the hypothesis must be reconsidered or confronted with the most severe judge, reality. I clarify that when the Zapatistas say reality, they include their actions in that reality, what you call practice. I then apply that same rule. If I find out these two elements that contradict my hypothesis, then I abandon the search, discard that hypothesis, and look for another one. Here it is, the complex hypothesis. My hypothesis is there is no solution. Notes. Here's, so here we're about to hear echoes of the earlier writings of the fourth world war. Notes. Balanced coexistence between humans and nature is now impossible. In the confrontation, the one who has the most time will win, nature. Capital has turned the relationship with nature into a confrontation, a war of plunder and destruction. The objective of this war is the annihilation of the opponent, nature in this case, humanity included. With the criterion of planned obsolescence or expected expiration, the commodity human beings expires in each war. The logic of capital is that of greater profit at maximum speed. This causes the system to become a gigantic waste machine, including human beings. In the storm, social relations are disrupted and unproductive capital throws millions into unemployment and from there into alternative employment, in crime and into migration. The destruction of territories includes depopulation. The phenomenon of migration is not the prelude to the catastrophe, it is its confirmation. Migration produces the effect of nations within nations. Large migratory caravans colliding with walls made of concrete, of police, military walls, criminal walls, bureaucratic walls, racial and economic walls. When we talk about migration, we forget the other migration that precedes it on the calendar. That of original populations in their own territories, now converted into merchandises. Have the Palestinian people not become migrants who must be expelled from their own land? Doesn't the same thing happen with the indigenous peoples around the world? In Mexico, for example, the native communities are the strange enemy that dares to desecrate the soil of the system's farm or plantation, located between the Bravo and the Suchiate rivers. To combat this enemy, there are thousands of soldiers and police, mega projects, buying of consciousness, consciousness, repression, disappearances, murders, and a veritable factory of guilty people, see freiba.org.mx. The murders of brothers Samir Flores Soberanes and dozens of nature guardians define the current governmental project. The fear of the other reaches, reaches levels of frank paranoia. Scarcity, poverty, misfortunes, and crime are responsible for a system, but now the blame is transferred to the migrant who must be fought until annihilated. In quote-unquote politics, alternatives and offers are offered, each one falser than the next. New cults, nationalisms, new, old, or recycled. The new religion of social networks and its neo-prophets, the influencers. And war, always war. The crisis of politics is the crisis of alternatives to chaos. The frenetic succession in governments of right-wing, extreme right-wing, the non-existent center, and what is presumptuously called left, is only a reflection of a changing market. If there are new models of cell phones, why not new political options? Nation states become custom agents of capital. There are no governments. There is only one border patrol with different colors and different flags. 
The dispute between the fat state and the starving state is just a failed concealment of its original nature, repression. Capital begins to replace neoliberalism as a theoretical, ideological alibi with its logical consequence, neo-Malthusianism. That is, the war of annihilation of large populations to achieve the well-being of modern society. War is not an irregularity of a machine, it is a regular maintenance that will ensure its operation and duration. The radical reduction in demand to compensate for supply limitations. It would not be about social neo-Darwinism, where the strong become rich and stronger and richer, where the strong and rich become stronger and richer, and the weak and poor become weaker and poorer, or eugenics, which was one of the ideological alibis for the Nazi war of extermination of the Jewish people, or not only. It would be a global campaign to annihilate the majority population of the world, the dispossessed dispossess them of life too. If the planet's resources are not sufficient and there is no spare planet, or it has not been found yet, although they are working on it, then it is necessary to drastically reduce the population. Shrink the planet through depopulation and reorganization, not only of certain territories, but of the entire world, a Nakba for the entire planet. If the house can no longer be expanded, nor, it's, nor is it feasible to add more floors, if the inhabitants of the basement want to go up to the ground floor, raid the cupboard in horror, they do not stop reproducing. If ecological paradises are self-sustaining, in reality they are just panic rooms of capital, are not enough. If those on the first floor want the rooms on the second and so on, in short, if modern civilization at its core private ownership of the means of production, circulation and consumption is in danger, well then you have to expel tenants, starting with those in the basement until quote unquote balance is achieved. If the planet is depleted of resources and territories, a kind of diet follows to reduce the obesity of the planet. Searching for another planet is having unforeseen difficulties. A space race is foreseeable but its success is still a very big unknown. Wars, on the other hand, have demonstrated their quote-unquote effectiveness. The conquest of territories brought the exponential growth of a quote-unquote surplus, quote-unquote excluded, or quote-unquote expendable. The wars over distribution continue. Wars have a double advantage. They revive war production at its subsidiaries and eliminate those surpluses in an expeditious and irremediable manner. Nationalisms will not only reemerge or have new breath, hence the coming and going of far-right political authors. They are the necessary spiritual basis for wars. The person responsible for your shortcomings is whoever is next to you. That's why your team loses, is the quote. The logic of cliques, gangs, and hooligans, national, racial, religious, political, ideological, gender, encouraging, medium, large, and small wars in size, but with the same objective of purification. Ergo, capitalism does not expire, it only transforms. The nation state long ago stopped fulfilling its function as a territory government population with common characteristics language, currency, legal system, culture, etc. Nation states are now the military positions of a single army, that of the car capital cartel. In the current global crime system, governments are jefes de plaza that maintain control of the territory, the bosses of the plaza. The political fight, electoral or not, is to see who is promoted to head of the plaza. The cobro de piso, is through taxes and budgets for campaigns and the electoral process. Disorganized crime thus finances its reproduction, although its inability to offer its subjects security and justice is increasingly evident. In modern politics, the heads of national cartels are decided by elections. A new society does not emerge from this bundle of contradictions. The catastrophe is not followed by the end of the capitalist system, 
but by a different form of its predatory character. The future of capital is the same as its patriarchal past and present. Exploitation, repression, dispossession, and contempt. For every crisis, the system always has a war at hand to solve that crisis. Therefore, it is not possible to outline or build an alternative to collapse beyond our own survival as indigenous communities. The majority of the population does not see or does not believe the catastrophe is possible. Capital has managed to instill immediatism and denialism in the basic cultural code of those below. Beyond some native communities, peoples in resistance, and some groups and collectives, it is not possible to build an alternative that goes beyond the local minimum. The prevalence of the notion of the nation state in the imaginary below is an obstacle. It keeps struggle separate, isolated, fragmented. The borders that separate them are not only geographical. The next section then, I'll leave for you all to read because it talks about, is this hypothesis correct? That there is no solution. And Captain Marcos lists out, actually, there are a few contradictions that make this not be true and lists out the resistances, the resistances, and the specific ones, like the ones that, basically the ones that maintain a balance with nature. As long as those exist, we have a chance, as small, as tiny as it is. The last communique, the common and non-property, is the new Zapatista quote-unquote initiative or strategy. There is a, with Lopez Obrador, who is now president, and he's understood as a progressive president, and the left from above loves him. They don't, they don't walk with the left from below. They, uh, what he's doing is, um, he has a, a vendetta against the Zapatistas from 2006, from what happened in 2006, and he, li and he likes to play it off as like, a pissing contest between him and Marcos, right? So the Zapatistas are very careful not to fall into that trap, but it's still, it's still a trope. And, and what he's doing is he's trying to destroy the Zapatistas. This is actually coming from his own intel. There was a big leak of documents, the Wakamaya leaks, in September 2022 that leaked Sedena, Sedena is like the, the intel of the Mexican state, their emails, and it was like six, six uh, terabytes of emails, and the leakers leaked, um, they didn't leak them all because they're not redacted, they're only giving them to journalists and researchers, but they did leak publicly about a couple of dozen of these emails, and those emails have Sedena telling Lopez Obrador that his biggest threat is the Zapatistas, and that they cannot, they don't have enough numbers to rally support on the ground, but don't provoke them at the international level because it'll be embarrassing for you. And so what Lopez Obrador has been doing, and the Zapatistas, especially since the pandemic in Chiapas and all over the world, we saw this in Palestine too. Since the pandemic, there has been a lot more belligerence against peoples. And in Chiapas, the way that it has looked is that there is a counterinsurgency. I mean, there's, there's a massive contestation between two cartels and the Mexican government. The Mexican military is in competition with the Sinaloa cartel and the Jalisco Nueva Generacion cartel to control territory routes. And all of them, including the Mexican military and the cartels, have diversified their portfolios. They're not just moving, for example, drugs. They also have a lot of, they're like, they're capitalists. They have a diverse portfolio of investments. And, and the Mexican military is becoming like a corporate uh, owner of these mega projects that Lopez Obrador is imposing, including the Maya train, which is a tourist train, a train that will also move resources extracted from the land that is destroying the, the jungles, the biodiversity of Southern Mexico and is encroaching into Zapatista territory as well. And 
with the promise of jobs. So people who have been dispossessed from the land support it. And this is really important to understand the support that Lopez Obrador has comes from the urban centers because he gives these cash handouts and you know these kinds of, yeah, these handouts to the cities, people who don't have any land. But in the rural areas, the rural areas are areas that are there for the value of the water and of the natural minerals. And so there's all of these concessions that get um, granted to corporate mines. And there's been resistances against this for decades. And the cartels are also now part of that, as is the Mexican military. So there's, there's a reorganization of space in this Fourth World War where the Mexican state doesn't even have control over its own territory. Is that container that we were talking about that is the nation state. There's an enormous decomposition of society in Mexico where people aren't caring about each other anymore. Everyone's like in survival now. And sadly, this is the case in Palestine too that I witnessed in 2010. I was going to go to Gaza. I, I, I'm a geographer and I did my entire dissertation on the borders and maps of Palestine to try to learn from the resistance about how they use the colonizers' tools in a strategic way. And I wanted to go to Gaza, and my university said, you can't go to Gaza, you set foot in Gaza, you're not going to get your degree. And you can go to the West Bank, but you have to sign this piece of paper that says that if you die, you're not going to hold us liable. Which is, I'm like, I'm like, well, I could just go to Gaza, and I'm going to die anyway. The thing is, it's a policing of research. And the West Bank, my university was following, like most universities, they follow the US State Department travel restrictions. And Gaza was at the highest and still is at the highest. And the West Bank had been as well, but it got knocked down to one below because of these economic reforms that were being implemented. So the West Bank and Gaza politically are two different models where one is economic reforms and the other one is abandonment, complete annihilation and abandonment. The other one is like a co-optation that will eventually lead to the annihilation of the Palestinians. But there's a lot of pacification where there are car loans, mortgages, things, debt, things that didn't exist before in the West Bank. Palestinian um, communities that look just like the Israeli settlements, like this assimilationist way uh, of, of trying to live. I, I was living in Bethlehem in uh, the old city where there's a lot of tourism, and I was working in the camps down the street, and the realities were very different in terms of resistance and the consciousness of resistance, where in the tourist parts of Bethlehem, people just wanted peace for a good business climate so the tourists can come, and they would get upset at the refugees when they would throw rocks at the wall, because then that would bring the tanks, and it would shut everything down, so then it would split Palestinian society. And that was just beginning in 2010, and by now, on the eve of October 7th, and still now I haven't been there in 10 years, I was told that there, are, there were people in the West Bank who would be completely fine with the occupation as long as they can have their cafes and their lattes and their Ramallah. Like Ramallah is this really big bubble. So this is something that George Jackson in Blood in My Eye, who was a Black Panther imprisoned and a theoretician of fascism and resistance. For me, he was like, he was worried about the health of the resistance to fascism, and he theorized the United States as the most advanced fascist society, and by that he meant it's reform, economic reform. Now you want to be part of it. Now, now you want to seek prestige, just like with your masters, right? And so it's, this, it's a mass psychology even bigger than what we're normally told, like with Europe, for example. Like now people's energies are in it, and now we're policing each other. That's social, the social decomposition. And that was what was happening in Palestine because of economic reforms. This was happening in Mexico, of course, here. And, and so this is then what Lopez Obrador is doing is nurturing that social decomposition and wants to be like the, like the father figure of the little Indian people, the native peoples, right? To, to give the handouts to rather than allowing them their lands, their villages, so that they can live with autonomy with their own ways and their own difference, which is the Zapatista project, a world where many worlds fit, land-based. What Lopez Obrador has been doing quietly 
and not so quietly, like if you pay attention to the, the COP conferences, the climate conferences where the biggest polluters in the world get together and they talk about how they're not going to pollute as much anymore. Uh, Lopez Obrador's schemes have been there, and one of his big schemes is something called Sembrando Vida, Sowing Life. And it's in their last communicator, where the hell the Zapatistas talk about it. It is a scheme that wants to uh, title land as private property where it didn't exist. So it's trying to do away with the commons, the ejidos, and that's actually why the Zapatistas went to war in January, January 1st, 1994, because NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, made it so that Mexico had to do away with the ejido, the state-mediated common lands that had been the success of the Mexican Revolution almost 100 years before in the Constitution. Now Mexico had to amend the Constitution, Article 27, to allow that land to open up for business. And what um, Lopez Obrador is doing now is he's making it so that he's giving these cash payments to campesinos, to peasants who work the land, if they can show that they have the title of a, of a certain amount of hectares. And we'll give them cash payments to plant trees. Their extractive is like fruit trees. Um, and sadly, what happens is that people are cutting down trees to be able to plant those trees because they get cash payments, not for stewarding forests, but for planting these new trees. And they're encroaching on a lot of the lands that the Zapatistas liberated in 1994 and calling them their own. And so it's causing a massive amount of fighting and paramilitary force against the Zapatistas. So in the last communique in this book, what the Zapatistas talk about is the commons. Let's make it so that we don't treat any land as private property, which is a very ancestral way of being with the earth. It's something that I also found in Palestine had been the case, which is not long ago when the British came in and colonized Palestine before Israel was created, the British were creating private property maps where private property didn't exist. Whereas before, Palestinians could ask their neighbor, with their neighbor figure out, what's the limit, what's the border, right? To our, your land, my land, it's that tree to that tree. And that sounds very banal. It's a very sophisticated and very strong because these are neighbors having to figure out what the borders are and they themselves are going to have to face the consequences of their decisions. They themselves are figuring it out. But when the British come and they impose these private property maps, they make it so that now everyone, oh, you don't have to talk to your neighbor, you have a border dispute, you just go to the colonial authority, and they'll tell you. So see how like it rips apart those practices of power and then shifts it to the above. So it goes from side by side to the above. And so the Zapatistas are trying, in their context, this is how they see a, a way to resist what's happening because they don't want to fight with violence, although they do not put their weapons down, and they said, we're going to where we need to, but that's not where we need to go. And in fact, in here, in that letter, Notes on Wars, there's a moment when Marco says, I'm not fully human because I have a gun, and to have a gun means that might is right, and that's not a full human. And we don't want to be soldiers, we want to be full humans, you know? So even though they have an army, that's not the first thing that they want to do, is go to that kind of war. They're trying to practice a different kind of power to build rather than destroy, especially because these are their neighbors, these are other native peoples just like them, who are all pawns in this entire scheme of global capital. I'll leave it there, it's, it's been two hours. And I would love, if we have time, I don't know if we have time, yeah, for, um, conversation, questions, anything, anything like that. Thank you so much for...
all you did was paint something or smash something. Meanwhile, um, comrades down there are like putting dynamite on the San Maya because they're saying we refuse to have our children become subservient to you um, or be become the objects of your, your sexual violence. You know, those kinds of communicating versus, you know, short-term gratification, vandalism, whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering that because I don't know that. Um, but, yeah. I don't know the answer. I love that question. You just taught me a lot. I had no idea that this was happening. Um, does anyone here maybe know communicate culture and or any thoughts on that? I know for sure the word palabra mm -hmm. is key, is very important in a lot of native cosmovisions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, as a weapon, the word can be a very, you know, the, there's a very famous compilation of the Zapatista communiques called Our Word is Our Weapon. So there's a recognition that that power is not just a force against something, right? It's not just a violent force. How, there's a, this is actually really, really important. In some Zapatista communiques, you'll see power capitalized with a capital P in lowercase. And they make, when they make that distinction, they say power capitalized is power over, power lowercase is power to, like the, the potencia like the potentials too. Um, so I don't know about that question, but it is, it's very admirable because it's a, it's a diversity of tactics, you know, where um, the word can travel in a way that an art piece cannot, in, or an action cannot, and it can be longer lasting too. But it's super important. I mean, I think about how, how can we be in communication with each other in this vast globe, um, and the way that I've been thinking about it is by publications like this, you know, spreading the word and having it in translation. And sadly, English has become the dominant, the dominant language. And at the same time, those of us who translate understand that also can be turned against it with, with this kind of stuff. So, you have thoughts on that? I don't think. Um, I have a question that has to do with something that you pointed out about your visit to Gaza in 2010 and how you saw something that you are seeing now that is happening in the Zapatista communities and um, that has to do with the Obrador uh, having this strategy to like divide people that if you think about it, um, by the way, you said that this was part of a broader tactic of um, indoctrinating people into capitalism, uh, convincing them that they can go up in that building uh, and turn against each other. Um, but I feel like Lopez Obrador comes from this uh, career, polit politics career, before Morena, PRD, before PRD, PRI, and PRI that was uh, 70 plus years in this dictatorship in Mexico, they were already doing this. They were uh, targeting the masses in misery, not even poor, poverty, in misery, by giving them food so they would go vote in masses for them, and, and just like that, with all the decision making that has to do with popular vote uh, or popular movement in general. And Lopez Obrador keeps doing that. Um, but I, there's, there's in particular in the indigenous people's movement in Mexico, I, I find it to be even more devastating and tragic because there are experiences like the La Matanza de Acter in 90, 1997, 1997 where this indigenous paramilitary group uh, paid by PRI, back then being the, the, the party in power, uh, they massacred a group of indigenous people that were um, um, uh, uh, in, in um, how do you say that, like in solidarity with the Zapatistas and in the most horrible way. And, and these people now, they have houses in the same hills where the survivors of the massacre live, paid by what they earn 
massacring the people. And so that is something that translates to all communities where there's always a group of people that for a, a, a thousand reasons decide that they are siding with you know, the oppressor. And um, I can only imagine how that looked like in Gaza. I've seen it in Mexico. Um, I've seen it here in my years living in this country. And I, I, I'm interested in knowing your opinion on how, how can we stop this <laughs> from happening? How? Because it's, it's the most devastating thing. Honestly, it's, it's just so heartbreaking to see your comrades the, the, the people around you, your society, your community, just, uh, and, and worst of all, understanding why you do it. Um, where that come, where the decision come from. Uh, but we, as the people that still want to resist, how, how can we facilitate that that stops from happening? What, what do you think about it what, for what you've seen? Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, I absolutely want to emphasize what you said. This is not new. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, and with Lopez Obrador, he's in a, it's a, it's a, the context is different, but the strategies are, you know, like when, when we think about power, and this is also um, shout out to George Jackson and then Michel Foucault and others built off of it. Um, when we think about power, Often we think about it as just violent force, right? A force on another body. There's also the power of, of discipline. Like in prisons, for example, you're being watched or you don't know if you're being watched, you know, you're gonna self-discipline. Although you don't believe in what you're doing, you're just doing it because you might get hurt. But you're not getting hurt, you're just threatened with it. And then there's the advanced fascism where you're just willingly being part of it. Willingly, So there's like the violent, naked power, the discipline, and then the willingness to be part of it. And those are modes of power that have existed probably forever. And it's one of those things where it depends on which one is more effective at the time, which one will be amplified. So we can have all of them working at the same time. Uh, it's just that one is maybe more efficient or more effective. And... And it was actually in the West Bank, not in Gaza. I never got to go to Gaza. I only got to the outside of Rafah crossing, but I never got to set foot in Gaza. I never had the honor. But it was in the West Bank where that strategy of economic reforms. So Gaza, the strategy Israel has on Gaza is of that naked violence. And in the West Bank, the strategy is to have a collaborationist Palestinian authority police the Palestinians on behalf of Zionism, on behalf of empire, so that the, the PA could prove that it knows how to run a state, which means knowing how to police your own people and policing your own territory. So that's a, that's a big distinction in these different strategies between Gaza and the West Bank. And in the West Bank, it was fairly new. I mean, it, I'm sure it existed some ways, but it was so systematically done and even being remarked by Palestinians there that this is terrible. What is happening? Like, this is new. People weren't doing this before. This is very new. In terms of what we can do, that is the question. And I'm happy that that's the question we're talking about. Um, at the most abstract, I think that, well, for me anyway, I am of the philosophy that all of us are potentially each other in our context. So if, um, if I'm in the context of a sociopath, maybe I would be a sociopath. I don't know, you know, but all of us are possibly each other. This is the in Lakesh, the I am we, the Bantu people in Mesoamerica, that all of us are each other. And so when I think about that, if that's true, then I think about what are those potentials that we are being rewarded to practice that are really harmful? And what are those potentials that we'd like to practice more that are loving, you know, or, or beautiful and, and generous? And I think about 
what is it that makes people want to participate? Like, you know, in Mexico, for example, and Mexico might be one of the great examples in, in the, on this question of fear. There's enormous amount of fear in Mexico. And so Lopez Obrador was kind of that hope that he would fix things and now people are saying it didn't happen. But, the, but a politics of fear, which is the basis of fascism, it makes it so that you want to go up because you're trying to survive and you need to climb up and you feel like you're drowning, right? And you don't, you don't see another alternative or you can't even imagine another alternative. For me, what has been helpful is the Zapatistas, seeing another alternative right now, not in the past, but right now, and how much they're trying, just that they're trying. And, and it's, it's something that I've had the honor of going to Chiapas and being in Zapatista territory, where it's a feeling. It's a feeling where that's how I know it's real. It could happen, it could possibly, and it was a feeling that I hadn't felt before, a feeling where you could just be yourself, a feeling where you're not being judged, there isn't this hierarchical ranking of you're more Zapatista than whatever this other, like that doesn't get rewarded. Like if people try, it kind of gets knocked down, you know, it just doesn't get, and, and so I make a joke just to provoke that I've, I've, I've never seen white people in Zapatista territory, except I have adjective white but not I'm the boss white. And this is a Malcolm X dis uh, distinction that he made in the later part of his life. That when he went to Africa and Mecca, he's like, people are just incidentally white. They don't treat you like they're the boss of you, like how they do in the United States. Like, I'm sure that's changing a lot with globalization of capital. <clears throat> and the reason why in, Zapat in Zapatista territory, I say I don't see white people, I don't see white people being mandones, like bosses, you know? And if they try, and it's not just white people who try, but all of us who've been raised by that society, that's our, our default switch. If we go in there and we try, it's not rewarded. You're not canceled, but you're just like looked at, okay, then move on to the next thing. You know, it's not, you're not fed when you're trying to be a boss. And so then that feeling, and when you mess up, someone will come and like talk to you really, like they're not gonna try to like chide you. That's not the way it goes over there that I have felt. And that has made it so that I've been able to feel like it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay, it's okay to, to transform and keep trying to be a better version of me, not trying to be a, like that person or like that person or like that person. So having more of these pockets, I think, as much as we can, because not everybody can travel to Chiapas, right? Not everyone, but it, the more that we can create spaces like this, I think that that, the feeling will tell us that it's true. And at least for me, it's what makes it, make, it, it's the inspiration for me wanting to keep making it true in my own geography. And as the Zapatistas say, this is global, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So we need to struggle everywhere that we are. So that to me, is an antidote to a politics of fear. A politics of fear is so laced with feelings of inadequacy, self-esteem, like trying to be better than the other than the other. Um, that at the worst, that you're not even valuable enough to live on the planet, you know, that politics of fear. And then there's a politics of care or a politics of love or whatever it is that we wanna call it, where we see each other in the other. So that's as abstract as I can get. In terms of what it looks like in the city, these little tiny moments where we're trying to treat each other different, restorative, transformative justice, for example, being with the earth, being with the earth as much as we can, as, as difficult as it is in the cities, um, trying to learn differently, trying to be with each other differently, it's not enough. At all, it's not enough, but at least it can get us toward like tasting it a little bit and then going from there. Because there isn't going to be a recipe for every place, right? But that's as much as, that's as far as I can, I can say for right now. <laughs> Thank you. Use, but like the, the way the power is and then like relationships within society and just 
just wondering if you'd be able to like kind of weigh in on like, I feel like, you know, I'm sure many of us feel like those other pieces are just like this example, like shed this like hope to look at where people are doing, you know, something so right, and then for this, so much that I have felt in the form, right, like looking at like the ones that they're going over here, some of these things like that, and, and, and like these really impressive, like, concrete ways to like look at how like Dr. Pieces have, you know, created their spaces or however you put it, but then also I felt like oddly like sad when I read the more recent communication of how much that is changing now, right, where like the hunters are being replaced by the goddess and stuff like that, and so I guess I was just wondering if you'd be able to weigh in on like, I don't know, like your understanding of the causes for some of those things or like how that um, how like the underlying goal kind of like carries through like this really big change in like the structure of the Zapatista community. Yeah, that's really important. The, the Zapatistas were organized for 20 years um, in, in, a, in a three level, three level phase, three level way, I guess. So it had five zones and there's a, several different language groups. And the zones don't necessarily map on neatly to language groups. Um, the, the five zones um, had, had a, have a, a local caracol, a, um, a zonal coordination point. It's, not, it's important to say it's not the governing body, but the coordination point. And then from there was a municipality coordination point and then the villages. And a reason why they, they made these coordination points, these caracoles, they call them spirals. There's a lot of beautiful things about that spiral for another time. Is because like when the Zapatistas first um, came onto the public international global scene, a lot of people went to Chiapas to try to support them. And they would go to, the, to those villages that were easiest to reach because there's already roads there and stuff like that. And then that made a lot of uneven development across Zapatista territories. So then they divided their territories into five zones. So anytime you wanted to do a project in Zapatista territory, you had to visit one of those caracoles, and then the caracoles would decide where things would go. And the important thing about the caracoles that uh, were run by the juntas de buen gobierno, the good government councils, is that those are rotating positions. There are no politicians at all in Zapatista territory. There's no careers in this. The idea is to capacitate everybody into it, even if it takes a long time. Because they really mean it when they say democracy. They're not talking about efficiency. They mean democracy. And the way that that functioned was that at the village level, there were decisions that were made. And then the coordination point, the next one would be the municipal level. And then the bigger coordination point for the big zone was the juntas de buen gobierno. And that was the case for the last two decades. And again, rotating position, capacitation, and it would be like a, so like if you had to go um, from your village to go participate in government, then the ideal situation is that you have someone in your community, people in your community that would take care of your milpa or, or your, your food growing, your household, for example. And it was a big challenge for women's participation when the men weren't capacitated to take care of a household. So uh, this is a generational struggle. So what the women would say is that we need to raise boys to learn how to cook and clean too. Like women contribute to patriarchy all the time when we want to raise macho boys, when you stop raising macho boys, you know? And then that can allow more participation. So recently in the fall, this fall, with a series of communiques, um, there was 20 communiques, uh, one of them talked about what you're talking about, how the juntas de buen gobierno and the municipalities are no more. And some people interpreted that to say the Zapatistas are no more, but that's not what happened. What happened is that they gave more power to the village level. So now every village level has a formal uh, autonomous, local autonomous government, the GAL, Gobierno Autonomo Local. And Whenever there's a need to do stuff at the municipal level, they will call a coordination body for that. And whenever there's a need for the caracol or junta level, but those are not permanent bodies, the juntas and the municipalities. 
the villages are the permanent bodies, which then makes it even makes the decision making process even more local. So I, I see it as a refinement of of direct democracy and decision making because, and they didn't say this in the communication, but they were insistent that if anybody with some letterhead or some ID that says they're from the municipalities or the juntas, do not accept it. Those no longer exist. They said that like twice in the communique, which I'm like, hmm, are there people that are maybe going around and corrupting themselves? You know, and I think that that may have happened, like because these programs, like Lopez Obrador's programs and stuff, they are very tempting. They are very seductive, especially when you're struggling, right? And so that change to me made it so that the decision making isn't so removed from each village, and so there's more oversight as well. And something important to say about that is that the key thing is how power is circulating. Because again, like if we get stuck on form, we might not notice how power is circulating. So they try to make it so that in rotating in into these positions from the local to the municipal to the zonal, that that would ward off corruption because corruption is costly when you have to keep buying off a different person each time because you keep switching, switching, switching. That's why like in DC, all of these politicians wanna be there for life because it's more efficient for them to make money, right? To be bribed, uh, they're more valuable in that way. If they can, you know, if they're there for a longer time. And so it's, to me, this seems like it's a more uh, democratic formation. It's likely also coming from the very difficult conditions that they're in, being shot at, all of these paramilitaries, because they also added in that communique that they will defend their communities. That every single community is going to be able to defend itself, or they will see to that. So I don't know if all of that is what took place, but that's kind of like how I'm reading it. So yeah, it remains to be seen. The nice thing too is that on January 1st, I think it was January 1st, or in the Commons uh, communicate, the last one. They said that um, they're going to invite people from all over the world to come work the land with them. Yeah, so everyone will be on the lookout for that communique when they do that. Um, and they want to learn from others how they're with the land too. And so that's, a, that's, I think, a really good opportunity for us to try to get together and try to figure out how can we do this. You can teach the boys how to cook. Yes. No more macho boys. <laughs> no. Okay, I was thinking my mic. Um, I'm, I'm really just so grateful for all of you. It's, it's like, like the old days for me. Because I was part of the Panthers in the Fillmore when I was a young person. Because they were making sense to me. And it was around some of the things you talked about. I'm Native American and I'm from the Southwest. And I think that you, this is like the Peñas. I don't know if any of you got to go to the Peñas, but in Mexico and, and Chile, especially before Aruba, which is where I was, there were theoreticians like us having these theoretical discussions. And it wasn't about how can we help somebody, because I think people get stuck. You know, when they, they just think that there's, they got to help somebody. But this is a theoretical discussion. And I did it when I was in my 20s and in Peñas. Women had to say, si me permite hablar. We had to ask permission before we spoke. Uh, so things have changed, you know, a little bit. But, um, quite a bit. But what I want to say is that the science is different. I'm a native scientist. And um, you're using the word transformative to describe what people are doing in Chiapas and, and Guatemala. The science of transformation is different from the science of building a bridge. And I guess I feel really honored and privileged, I'm almost 80, you know, that I can still show up and, and see that the theoreticians, for me, were the Marxists. That was what was important. So I was working with Chilenos and 
uh, people from the spine, you know, you know, people globally, as much as I knew, who were Marxists, because that's what was happening in the 60s and 70s. That was the step, but it was limited. You know, it only took us so far. And now the science has changed. This is the science of chaos. When we talk, when I hear the discussion and I listen to what you're, you're bringing out from, from the discussion, it's where, and I want to offer this, especially how do we persist, you know, not just play whack-a-mole, being resilient, you know, but really change, and how do we, how do we change and stay alive during these changes? I just want to offer this one thing. When a caterpillar eats and eats and eats and eats, and then all of a sudden, the caterpillar decides it's time to digest itself. And so she starts some chemical changes. And she has the courage to know it's time. I think you are telling us, telling me, it's time. I have to dissolve the old way of thinking. I have to say goodbye to the old science. I have to accept that the changes that I have lived my whole life working for are based on chaos and complexity and transformation. And that caterpillar turns into what's called bug soup. <laughs> okay? And there are pieces, chunks of the caterpillar. You can look at there's great articles in Scientific American or different places. But it turns into chunks of soup. And some people in the sciences are calling them islands of sanity. So this is an island of sanity <laughs> that we've all created together with you. This is a place where we belong and where we don't know what's happening next, but we're going to be, we're, we've decided we're going to be transformed. No going back, like in labor, you know. I'm going to be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Great, we've still got the next contraction. So we've committed. You know, we're giving birth here. You're asking us to give birth to a new way of being. The Zapatistas are, are leading the way they have. And so eventually, there's a word called consilience in science where everything jumps together. Those chunks of bug soup, they go poof, they, they come together. And of course, it transforms into a butterfly. And the challenge is twofold. One is in being comfortable with bug soup. So I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to be bug soup. All the stuff I thought I believe, I don't believe anymore. So I'm going to be real confused, right? That's bug soup. And being comfortable and OK with being in bug soup. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge is that when a butterfly actually comes together, you know, it has to struggle out of the, out of the, what's it called? Cocoon. The cocoon. It has to struggle because if it doesn't, the wings will be too wet for it to fly. So in the struggle, in our birth, to use the birth metaphor, we're going to have to struggle and be okay with that struggle to birth through the changes you're asking us to make. We're in a new science. And I live long enough to see it. I'm so happy. <laughs> And I'll leave it at that. I don't know <laughs> how y'all feel, yeah. Uh, hey, I was going to ask if she could step up to the podium. But yeah, with the, the microphone. Yeah. She's, she's all right. <laughs> if you'd like to take the, if you wanted to be on the podium with the oh, microphone. No, no, that's a new science. Good story. <laughs> <laughs> Because we, everyone was focused. We didn't try to hide it. I'm sure, but 
See, I think one of the things that, that I heard her say in leadership in this new science, we would all be sitting in a circle, shoulder to shoulder. And she would still be doing a two hour rap, just like you've been here. You know, people used to just stand up and talk for three hours. And everybody sat there with wine, you know, eventually. But, you know, it's like, but we would all be the circle around you. Maybe the concentric circle with some, some, few, some people in the middle and there's somebody on the outside. You know, so that's the kind of color also, right? Yeah. And so I, mean, I would suggest that we need to look at new ways that we set up our conversations. New formats, you know, mm -hmm. new, I, I don't know, I'm just making this up because of what you said, but <laughs> it, seems, it seems reasonable to me that that's also the things that we're going to be playing with if we continue on this new way that she's asking us to go. It's beyond nation uh, I'm, I'm stepping in. This was great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. If I've done one thing, I hope it's to convince everyone that movements are thinkers. They're theoreticians. And um, maybe academia is overrepresented in terms of knowledge production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, hope that, I hope that we see the compas like that more. And um, thank you. Thank you for that.